This is a 1997 Trek Y22. It is a carbon fiber, full suspension mountain bike from an era where, as you can see, they looked absolutely insane. Today, I'm gonna to take it for a ride and I'm gonna tell you all about it. Now this particular model, the Y22, is made of carbon fiber, at least the main triangle is, and back in 1997, this would have been $2,200. If you adjust for inflation, that puts it at close to $4,000 in today's money. Some people today consider that almost entry level or mid end, which is insane, but back then this would have been kind of in the middle. There were some models above it and some models below it. Now I feel a little strange calling this a carbon front triangle because it's not a triangle at all. In fact, it's a Y. That's where the Y series gets its name. Carbon back in the 90s was kind of sketchy sometimes, but not the Y series. Most of these that broke were left on the roof rack and driven into the garage. This was regarded as a pretty strong bike. Now the reason the shape of this bike frame looks so insane is that back then every bike company was trying to come up with their own version of what a full suspension bike should be and this one was so popular that actually a lot of people copied it. Nowadays full suspension bikes look more like hardtails than they did then. There's a triangle in the front and a triangle in the rear and it seems like we've kind of come full circle in that regard. Full suspension bikes looked completely different than hardtails in the 1990s. Instead of using triangles, engineers just went through the alphabet and started throwing around letters. But in all fairness, they were working with a completely different set of parameters. Suspension options were kind of limited. 26 inch was the only wheel size. And as you can see, stems were all 95 feet long. These bikes are kind of a product of their environments. Back then, mountain bikers did not mess with their seat posts as much as they do now. There's not even a quick release here. And you can see the limitation here imposed by the rear triangle. This is where the seat post would crash into if you put it too low. And speaking of the rear triangle, this part of the bike is not carbon fiber, it's aluminum alloy. And actually one of the selling points of the bike was that it featured a low maintenance bushing in the linkage. Instead of bearings, it was a bushing. Today we use skateboard bearings in bikes, but back then bearings actually caused problems in linkage. The bushing was a selling point. And with all these different materials and bushings and what appears to be a strange design, the bike is held up pretty well. This one is extremely well preserved. You can see it has basically all of the original parts it would have had in 1997, including the period correct boots on the front suspension. Speaking of the suspension, and also kind of hilarious by today's standards, the fork has 80 millimeters of travel and the rear has 100 millimeters of travel. That's not much travel at all, and if anything today, there will be less travel in the rear and more travel in the front. And if you think the suspension is strange, the geometry is even stranger, kind of normal for the time, but a far cry from today's bikes. Everything from the bottom bracket to the C-tube is way up high, the bike is super short, and then it's got this super long stem. And as if your weight was not positioned far enough over the front wheel, these Bontrager race bar ends came standard on the bike. A modern gravel bike is more enduro than this. Now, despite all those things I just said, the bike actually climbs really well. I didn't have one pedal strike today, and it was able to navigate pretty technical terrain. Surprisingly, single pivot bikes are not known for their efficient climbing platform. I don't know if it's efficient, but I can tell you it's capable. Another reason this bike climbs so well, it is just over 26 pounds, that's really, really light. Today, that's what a seven or $8,000 cross-country bike might weigh. 
This was a $2,200 full suspension whatever. They didn't really separate into categories back then, but there's a reason for that. Bikes in every single dimension were just smaller in the mid 90s. The wheels were 26 inches. The tires didn't have nearly as much meat on them. The frame was just smaller and there was just less bike in every way. So then, how does it ride? Well, actually, it rides pretty good. As I mentioned, it climbs pretty well for what it is. It does bob around a little bit when you're pedaling like you might expect on a primitive-ish single pivot bike. But the suspension is surprisingly smooth. These are little skinny tires with inner tubes pumped way up. It's really not that bad. Now when it comes to descending, you just really can't compare it to a modern mountain bike. Even the cheapest modern mountain bikes just have better geometry and bigger tires and they're just better for descending. But measured against other bikes from the time, this would have been pretty impressive and if you would have showed up to the trailhead with one of these, it would have turned some heads. Despite the somewhat primitive linkage, this was a unified rear triangle. So your crank set attaches to the same part of the bike that your rear wheel attaches. So there's no chain growth or kickback. So in other words, if you're going off of a drop or pedaling, it's not like cycling the suspension actually puts tension on the chain. All of this is kind of unaffected by the movement of the bike. But there wasn't much of anything isolating your actual body movement from the suspension linkage. And so when you're just pedaling down the trail, you do feel it bobbing up and down. And it's just kind of a characteristic of bikes from this time period. Another interesting factoid, this was the first year this bike was available with V-brakes. You can still see the mount for the cantilever brakes on the back here. With cantilever brakes fitted to this bike, there would have been a lot going on back here and it would have been kind of a mess. And so these V brakes were certainly a big upgrade. Talking about components, how about this carbon SRAM derailleur? Wow, there's of course no clutch on this, but there was grip shift up front, which was all the rage at the time. While we're up here at the cockpit, look how narrow it is. I did mention this super long stem, but if these brake levers were any closer together, they would be overlapping. This was just how bikes were made at the time. And actually, I find myself holding onto these bar ends more often just because they're way at the end and it gives me more stability. Now I mentioned the suspension fork is 80 millimeters. This is a RockShox Judy, and at the time, elastomer suspension forks were pretty popular. The fork actually has these rubber cylinders inside of it that compress, and that's what gives you your shock absorption. To preload it, you just turn these knobs, and it just adds a little bit of pressure onto the elastomer, and that's how the fork works. Much less common back in the 1990s, the rear shock this is actually a Fox air shock. You pump it up with air just like you would today, except there's no adjustable rebound damping and there's not much room for anything inside of it with this 38 millimeter shaft. These were different times, but it was still Fox and rock shocks. Another thing you'll see all over this bike is OCLV. That was kind of Trek's claim to fame. It was the process by which they kind of sucked air out of the carbon mold. I'm not an expert on carbon manufacturing, but apparently at the time, this was pretty impressive. And actually, this carbon frame was manufactured in the USA, or at least it says so on the frame. In 2023, that is almost unheard of. Also kind of interesting, they decided to paint the carbon fiber. Back then, it was all the rage to just let the carbon fiber show. If you get the model above this bike, it's a raw carbon fiber frame. Now the Trek Y series was far from the only full suspension platform at the time, and it probably wasn't even the most influential one, but in one way this bike was very important in that it appealed to the masses. 
There were a whole bunch of different models. There was a cheaper model than this. There was made of aluminum. There was a more expensive model. There was this one, which was, I think, the most popular. And it was successful enough to span six model years. So these sold pretty well, they became pretty common, and it is in every way a great example of a successful mountain bike from the 90s. And so the Trek Y series was one of the earliest mainstream full suspension mountain bike platforms that really stuck around for a long time. And it was strong, it was affordable, it appealed to the masses, it was available in different models. It kind of had all the characteristics that you would expect from a full suspension mountain bike today, but it uh, looked very different. Now my last point is a subjective one. I think this bike is absolutely beautiful. You have to suspend what you consider beautiful in 2023, but this is, and they took a lot of things into consideration to make it beautiful. First of all, all the cables run down the left side of the frame. And so if you look at it from the drive side, it's super clean. I'm not gonna say understated, but clean. It's also worth noting that at the time, this would have been a massive departure from a normal triangular bike frame, and you know how cyclists react to new things that look different. And so if they would have made it ugly, that would have been really bad, but they didn't. They made it look beautiful, and it kind of caught on. Thank you, Tyler Hawes, for lending this bike for us to review. It's people like you who keep bikes like this in such good condition that allow us to glimpse back into the past and get a little piece of mountain bike history. This is amazingly well-preserved all the way down to the original ESP grips. And so it's been a pleasure to ride this bike today, to examine it, and to share it with all of you. I wrote this article about why experts have a difficult time getting through to beginners. This article and many other articles written by some of the most interesting voices in mountain biking are available on my Substack. Not only that, but you'll get the video you just watched two weeks early with no ads. Get interesting articles, ad-free early videos, discussions, and help me break free from the algorithm on Substack. I hope you enjoyed this look at the Trek Y series. It's a little piece of mountain bike history. I hope you learned something today, and if you didn't, I hope you at least found it entertaining. Thanks for riding with me today, and I'll see you next time.